My name is Rich Bowen, and I currently work on the open source group at AWS. Um, I've also been around the Apache Software Foundation for about 25 years, and I'm currently serving on the board. And a lot of us live at that intersection between passion for open source and trying to keep your job. And uh, uh, some of you, I think a few of you were in Arun's talk before this, and he, he talked about this some as well. Um, for the past nine years, well, previously to joining AWS, for nine years I was at Red Hat, and talking about open source at Red Hat is, is easier because theoretically everyone there knows and believes in open source. And so when you're working for another company, you have to start developing strategies for how you talk to management about open source in ways that they will hear. Um, so ideally, you are interested in the success of your company. You're not just there to have a good time or work on your pet project. You want your company to succeed because that in turn benefits you. Um, and correct understanding of open source is a long-term investment in the success of your company as well as in your own career. So this is some of the, some of the things that I'm gonna talk about. Um, and this leads to the question of why do you do open source? What are, what are some of the reasons that you all got involved in open source? Anyone have some, uh, some thoughts on that? But don't be shy. Um, <laughs> all right, well, well some, of the, some of the common reasons that people come up with when asked this question in surveys are because it's fun. It's something that I do for enjoyment. It's a hobby. Or um, I want to solve a problem that I personally have with a piece of software that I've been using. I want to make it better for myself. But a lot of the other reasons that we hear are things like socialization, making friends, um, giving back to the community, some sort of sense of moral obligation, and uh, maybe some, in some way making the world a better place for those that come after us. Um, this, uh, this graph here is from a survey that was conducted by opensource.com several years ago, and the, the top reasons that are listed here are to learn something new, career development, resume building. Um, fun is another one that, that, uh, that got a high ranking here. And altruism was the third thing that got a high ranking here. And one of the great things about this event and some of the other events that I attend is there this, this great opportunity to sit around the campfire with friends and make new friends. Um, we all have stories about our management that really just doesn't understand open source, and we like to laugh about that around the campfire. And uh, it's, it's a, a sense of camaraderie and a shared experience, and this is absolutely not why your company is involved in open source. And so keeping that passion alive while also doing the things that keep your company alive um, is kind of critical to those of us that like to, to pay our bills. So a little bit of clarification. When I say doing open source, this can mean, obviously, a wide variety of activities. Um, it can mean contributing to existing projects, or it can mean taking an internal project and making it open source, and whatever the reasons that the company has for doing that are are varied and nuanced across different businesses. Or it can mean consuming open source as part of either your tool chain or just as a way to do daily business. So these are, are very different things that, uh, that a company might mean by doing open source. Now, I, I should mention that because you're sitting here in this room, presumably your manager supports open source in some way. They've sent you here for, a, for some sort of purpose. Maybe they've thought through that purpose, or maybe they haven't. Um, I, I'm aware that not everyone has a manager that is as deeply involved in open source as mine is. My manager is the president of the Apache Software Foundation. And so he, he really gets open source at a deep level and has been involved in open source 
for 20-some years. Um, the guy that was on stage right before me, Arun Gupta, he's been he's in management at Intel, and he's been involved in open source for 20 plus years. And those sorts of people are heavily represented at this event. But uh, not everyone is as lucky in management as I have been over the years. So you have to be able to speak their language. The other disclaimer that I have is that open source is weird. Um, and each project is weird in its own unique way. Oh, by the way, this is my, my wife and my goddaughter wearing tinfoil hats. So uh, they're weird too. Um, but just, just to mention that nothing in open source is a guarantee. And just because you can do everything right, if you follow all of the cultural rules of open source, that project can still fail. Your, your contributions might not be accepted. You might not mesh with the particular weirdness of the projects that you care about. Because as you all know, open source is part culture and part religion and part science and part law and part ego um, with a lot of language and time zone and network latency thrown in. And so it, it's, uh, it, these, these things are not guarantees. But like I said, when you're talking to management about open source, you must speak their language. And when I was, when I was writing this presentation, it occurred to me that I might come across as saying, you should lie to management about your motivations so that they'll let you do what you want to do. And that's, that's really not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that open source is above all a practical pursuit. Um, a lot of us do it for fun, and a lot of open source projects are not business oriented in any way. But a lot of open source is there because it's objectively a better way to build software. And doing what's good for the community is doing what's good for the customer because there's an overlap there. And I'm definitely not telling you to lie to management about what you do and why you do it. Re merely to understand where they're coming from, helping them to understand where you're coming from, and that those things serve a mutual interest. So what's in it for the company? Well, it would be, it would be reductionist to say that companies only care about money, um, only care about profit. Uh, they also care about recruiting the best workers. They care about serving uh, the customers. They care about building a reputation. And a lot of companies actually care about making the world a better place, about leaving a legacy, leaving something for the coming generations that's better. And so I, I don't want to say it's necessarily all about money, but that is at the heart of a business, the reason that a business continues to exist is to generate a profit. So when you talk with management about open source, the first thing that I want to encourage you not to do is jump straight to philosophy. Um, this book that I have here, I, I hugely recommend that you read it. It is a bunch of philosophical essays by luminaries from the early open source movement. And there's actually a second edition of this book as well with another set of essays. And these are, these are great essays like The Cathedral and the Bazaar, and um, Larry Wall's got something in there about the attributes of an of a, uh, open source revolutionary. Um, there's discussion in here about the nuances between free and open. And this is not what you want to talk to your manager about because their eyes will glaze over and they will try to figure out what this crazy hippie is talking about when I just want to talk about business value. Um, certainly not in the first conversation anyway, certainly not in your five minute opportunity with your CEO in the elevator up to the top floor. So these, these are conversations to be left much later. Uh, if, you, if you focus on these deep philosophical questions in that first conversation, you will have lost your opportunity to speak with them again. Don't spend a lot of time talking about the nuanced differences between open source licenses. 
That also is a much later conversation. And that will make them think that they are getting themselves into legal trouble and maybe this is a thing to avoid rather than to embrace. And certainly don't get involved in the jargon. Try to avoid jargon when you're discussing open source with management that's not deeply familiar with the community because we use words in open source in ways that the rest of the world does not. Um, we use terms like upstream that make people confused as to whether you're talking about software or phishing. And uh, that is a distraction from the core point. The other thing I want to mention is that you have a brief, you have a, a very short period of time at the beginning of a conversation to convince management that what you're saying is worth their time. They've got another meeting that they need to go to next hour. They just came out of a meeting um, and they have a lunch date with an important executive from another company. And so you need to make sure that you understand your own message. You need to make sure that you know the core message that you're trying to communicate and don't go rambling off on um, the, the deep details of the patch that you're trying to get into the kernel. Uh, if you spend that time discussing about whether it's free as in beer or free as in freedom or free as in puppies, then again, you have, you've missed that brief window of time that you have to talk with this, with this person whose time is valuable. All right, so philosophy. The next thing that you want to do in open source is to give back to the community. You are, you're, you're building something, your, your company is relying on this thing in the commons, and so it is your moral obligation to give back to it. And I happen to believe that, but that is not, that's not really why your company is involved in this. Um, your attitude that open source contribution is a moral obligation or for the greater good or something like that comes across as nonsense to somebody who is trying to run a business profitably. Uh, Don Foster, in a talk yesterday, made the point that if you talk about what you do in open source as charity, then that becomes the first thing that will be cut when there are budget constraints. Uh, because we're running a business, we're not running a charity. And so we need to understand what we get for what we give. So what should you talk about instead? You should talk about the supply chain. If you are building a multi-billion dollar business on the back of an open source project, then you want to make sure that that open source project exists next year. And if you do not contribute meaningfully to that project, then you are simply taking, and that gives that project no incentive to stick around. It doesn't keep it staffed. It doesn't keep the lights on. It is not because of a moral obligation. It's because you are trying to ensure the sustainability of the thing that you're building your business on. And uh, if the open source project is that little paperclip there and you are not strengthening it, then you might not have a business next year. And trying to, one of the questions that we asked at, at AWS, we have this concept of, uh, of um, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank, I always do this. Of, uh, open, of open source projects that are strategic to the business. And one of the questions that we ask in the strategic project process is, what would be involved to replace this functionality if the project went away tomorrow? Do you have the staff or expertise to ensure that that functionality would continue and that your service would not fall over the next month? And this is not simply a question to help to say you should hire more people, although that's part of it. It's a question to help the team understand that they are making an investment in a project. They should understand what's involved in keeping the lights on there and be participants in that. Um, be ready to demonstrate with numbers to your manager how this project is a critical part of your product and your supply chain. Don't just say, oh, we used this library somewhere in the code. Um, help them to understand what percentage of your profit 
comes from this open source project. How you're, you're not simply giving back out of moral obligation, but in order to sustain your supply chain. Also, remember that this is long-term thinking because um, it can look in the short term like you're wasting your time uh, working with a, a project that is humming along quite happily. It looks healthy. Why should we be concerned? You should be concerned because next year and the year after that, the, the things will change around this project. And if you are not involved in directing that change, then it's going to happen in ways that you do not anticipate or desire. As part of this, don't be afraid to tell scary stories. Um, these logos here, if you don't recognize them, are Heartbleed and Meltdown and Spectre. These were highly publicized bugs in security-related open source software a few years back, and they cost the industry many billions of dollars. And each one of them happened because projects that were critical to the entire world's supply chain were maintained by a handful of underfunded people. Now, as a result of these scary stories, these particular projects are now much better supported, both financially and with uh, developer power, than they were when these problems happened. Uh, Log4Shell is another great example of it that is more recent in people's memories. It's a project that was maintained by a relatively small group of people and so didn't have a lot of attention on it, but was critical to the projects and products of many or even most of the companies across the world. And you need to be involved in projects that you are relying on. Otherwise, you don't get a say in how it happens, and you don't have the insight into whether there's going to be a catastrophic failure next week. Um, I would caution you to, to communicate that in each one of these cases, the problems didn't happen because they were open source, and they were, in fact, fixed faster because they were open source. And so the, the focus here is on um, the, the lack of community engagement rather than on the fact that they were open source. Now, I'm sure you've seen this, this uh, cartoon a hundred times this week. Um, the emphasis that I want to make here is that your company is one of those things that's teetering up on the top there. And if you are not actively involved in shoring up the tiny pieces down at the bottom, then you are risking your, in, your company's future on your inaction. So we are all in this together. I would encourage you to focus on data. Your manager wants data. They don't want your speculations about how open source is a, uh, a fun community good. They want data that, that maps the success or failure of that project to the success or failure of the company. And uh, aligning that with numbers, preferably profit numbers, is an important part of this message that will ensure that they get the message and understand that this is non-optional. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, sustainable open source um, is a topic that other people have spoken on at this event, and each one of these bullet points is an entire other presentation or indeed another conference as a whole. But uh, one of, one of what I believe to be the core values of a sustainable open source project is that there are multiple voices involved. If there's only one voice involved, then that project will only reflect the values of that voice, not the values of your company uh, or of your customers, only the values of that, that voice's customers and community. So you want to make sure that your stockholders, your shareholders, not your stockholders, but your shareholders, your, uh, your uh, stakeholders is the word I'm looking for there, are all heard in the conversation around this project. Um, you know, the, the, obvious, the obvious statement here is that single vendor projects are only about that vendor's priorities. And if that vendor's priorities change at some point, then you will be left out of that conversation. We've seen a number of examples over the last couple of years where an, an important open source project has been controlled by one company and that company's, that company's priorities have changed 
they've changed the license or they've stopped supporting it at all and the, the project has died, leaving the rest of us to scramble to fill that hole in our supply chain. And of course, single maintainer projects are even scarier for the same reasons, but more so. Um, it, you know, every time that, that we discover that one of our one of our service teams is relying on an open source project that's supported only by one individual in their spare time, um, we strongly encourage them to either get involved in that project or if they're unable to, that they find something else to fill that hole. Uh, one thing that has become evident in the last two in the last year is that uh, Ukraine has a thriving open source community that has been greatly harmed by uh, the news of the last year, the war. And uh, we've seen a number of situations where we have had to um, either help somebody get out of the country in order that that project doesn't die, or uh, you know, find some other, and this sounds like a very selfish way to talk about it, but this is what your management wants to hear. How are we shoring up our, our supply chain uh, based on the uncertainty of the world. All right, another reason that people give for getting involved in open source is to earn merit and reputation and to stoke our own egos. Um, I see that there's a few people in the room that are old enough to have watched The Breakfast Club when it came out. Um, and of course, these were two individuals in there that were very concerned about their image. And uh, your company is not interested in you being popular in open source projects. That is not a priority for them. Um, so you, you want to do these things. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very common reason that people give for getting involved in open source. But what you should talk about to your manager instead is building trust and influence in projects that your company depends on. Because if you have that influence in that project, then you are able to steer that project in ways that benefit your company. Now, I don't want to uh, encourage <laughs> anti-community behavior in projects. Um, also, this can be really dangerous if your company does not understand open source so social norms. And so, um, if you are not familiar with how to correctly behave yourself in an open source community, this is the, the building to be in. There's people here that can tell you about that. Make sure that you understand that you spend time steeping in the culture of the open source project to make sure that you are behaving in ways that are appropriate and are going to not alienate you and do the opposite of what you're trying to do in gaining trust. Um, don't claim that your company owns or invented or drives an open source project because that is not something that the rest of the community will find to be terribly encouraging to them. Be very, it's, it, it's perceived as being very dismissive of the other players in the project. If you claim in your marketing, we're the ones that drive this project. And uh, I know that sounds very ham-fisted, but I've seen that kind of marketing even at this event where companies say, we are the driving force between Apache thingy or whatever it is. And uh, that is never well received by those of the com community that don't work for your company. And then also, there's no guarantee that your contributions will be accepted or that your, your, uh, your, contr your presence will be welcome. And so be careful about promising too much to your management about what we will be able to do as soon as we get in there and start changing this project because that might not happen. And this is, as I said before, a super long-term investment. Um, Arun mentioned just a few minutes ago on stage here that, that uh, the things that we do in open source today, we'll see the fruit from in three years. And your salespeople don't think in those terms. They think about the next quarter's uh, earnings report. And so being very clear in communicating that we are making long-term investments, um, you know, you need to be careful about that messaging with management so that they understand what they're getting into. Um, your customers 
often we'll see, and this, this is something anecdotally, I don't have a survey to reference, but our customers tell us that leadership in open source projects is a, a uh, reason to trust the company. And so if somebody is looking to AWS for a managed Kafka service, for example, which we have, they look for leadership in that community and say, well, these people know what they're talking about. They're not, just, they're not just taking somebody else's thing and running it. They are also playing in that same field and providing leadership and direction in that community so that they understand the pains that we feel as a customer. Also talk about driving adoption. Um, healthy open source communities encourage adoption of services based on those projects or products based on those projects um, because they see those projects as being sustainable. Um, one, one thing that we've been told repeatedly is that people don't come um, to, in particular, they don't come to AWS and then say, what database should we run? No, they choose a database and then they look around for the best place to run that in the cloud. And so we strive to be that. But uh, if, if uh, you have a leadership position in a particular project, then they'll say, well, maybe these people know what they're talking about. Um, all right, the next thing that people say that they do open source, the reason they do open source is because it's a lot of fun. Um, this is a, a photo from a conference that I attended in November in, in Nairobi, Kenya, and a bunch of my, my new friends on the party bus. And uh, I've been coming to these conferences, uh, I think the first one I went to was in 1996. I come here to meet and hang out with my oldest friends, and uh, I, I am shameless about that to my manager that, that I want to attend this conference in particular, because I know there's people here that I won't see anywhere else. Um, and open source is an endless party and definitely the source of my longest friendships. And your company does not care about your fun, despite what they said when they were recruiting you or in your onboarding. That's not why you're there. And uh, so one of the things that, that I try to emphasize when we're talking about how much fun open source is, is that uh, my employer believes in open source. If you come work for us, you'll get to keep working on open source. And this is a great recruiting tool. It's a great tool for developer happiness. Um, I ten attended a great talk yesterday about improving the happiness of your developers, which is not something that a lot of, a lot of managers care a lot about, but Investing in the happiness of your developers keeps them around. It keeps them productive. It uh, helps prevent burnout. And being involved in healthy, vibrant open source projects is one of the ways to keep developers happy. Um, a, a little warning here. I have a, a colleague who last year went to work for a large company that uh, told him that he would be working full-time on open source and uh, that he could continue to work actively upstream. And after several months of working for them, it became clear that that was just a hook to get him in the door and they didn't mean it at all and he was not spending any of his time working on open source. And that is a really super fast way to both burn out good talent, but more importantly, I now know that I would never recommend for someone to work at that particular company because I know that they're dishonest and that they are taking advantage of the open source community to, to meet their own ends. And so, you know, be careful that if you make these sorts of promises that you mean them. Um, the number of people that I've talked to in the last 10 years who got a great open source job and then suddenly realized, well, you're only gonna be working upstream um, when you have time after the more important things that we have for you to do. Uh, it's, it's truly discouraging because a lot of really talented open source people have been burned out that way. Let's see, also, if you are hiring open source people, what, whatever that means, whatever an open source person is, one of the traits that I've seen among open source people over the years is that they tend to be um, very opinionated 
and tend to lean towards uh, being a bit anarchic. So it can be a little difficult to manage. So make sure you know what you're getting into because open source people feel overwhelmingly that they know what is the right thing to do and they're gonna do it. And this is a valuable, valuable personality trait but can lead to people that may be a little difficult to manage. So know what you're getting into. All right, resume building. Resume building is an important reason that people get involved in open source. Um, and if, if you're doing this in college, where you get involved in open source projects as a way to build your skill and make sure that you have a, a leg up in the business, um, that's really cool. If you're doing this as part of your job, your manager might see this as you trying to simply use them as a stepping stone to your next real job. Um, your employer is very not interested in you building your resume. So instead, talk about continuing education. Talk about building your skill set. Talk about building the skill set of your team. The very best way to become an expert in a technology is to dig into the code and become an expert on the technology. Not just to be a user, not just to read people answers off Stack Overflow, but to get in there and not only understand the code, but also participate in inventing the next generation of the code. Making you the world leading expert on that, on that technology, rather than just one of the many people who read a blog post. And so I find this to be a very compelling argument um, for, especially if you happen to be working for a software company, like many of us do, um, this is a very compelling argument for allowing people to work in open source because it is, it's, uh, it's free training on the inner workings of that particular project. Now, I say free, and we throw the word free around very, very loosely. Um, one of the things that you will uh, hear from management that is not very involved in open source is, well, isn't open source, isn't it free? You know, don't we just get it for free? We're allowed to use it however we want. This is a free kitten that my daughter brought home from the park and uh, now destroys our curtains and uh, uh, eats our food and, you know, gets in our hearts as well. But, but uh, you know, open source is free as in puppies. A free puppy, a free kitten is not free. It is a long-term investment. Um, open source is every bit as expensive as proprietary. You're just putting your, your expert, you're putting your money somewhere else. However, that money that you're putting into that is building your expertise. It is building your trust with your customers, with those projects that you rely on and you're not just paying a bill to receive a product, you are actively engaged in creating that project, that product. And so instead of, say, of emphasizing the monetary savings that go along with open source, which are, are real but nuanced, um, instead talk about creating customer value. When we're engaged in open source, we are ensuring that the Software that we're delivering is what the customer wants because the customer will tell us what their pains are and we can go solve those pains in those projects because we're involved with them, because we have earned the trust of that community and our voices are listened to. And presenting this to the project takes the form of saying, well, this, this project is great, but the customers have this particular pain with it. And if they do, then your customers do as well, even if they're not telling you. And as a community, we improve that software stack together to produce something that solves everyone's needs. Um, so one of the phrases that uh, you'll hear coming out of the mouths of people that work at Amazon is undifferentiated heavy lifting. And this refers to the notion that the stuff that we all care about is the commodity. It's the open source project. We all work on that together. Some of it's boring, but we want to solve the problems that everybody has so that we can focus on the thing that we do exceptionally well. And you can focus on the thing that you do exceptionally well. And this allows you to uh, be very clear in communicating with your customers what your particular value proposition is 
And that value proposition is usually not the underlying software. Um, if you happen to be AWS, that value proposition is, is large scale and operating clouds. If you happen to be Intel, that is creating the, the silicon that those things run on. And it allows you to be very focused when you're selling to your customers so that they know what they're getting from you. Uh, the other thing that open source gives is the ability for those customers to build and test at home and understand the technology themselves and then look at the vendor that best serves their other needs. And then you can focus on being that vendor. All right, I am getting to the end of my time, I believe. Um, there's, there's a bunch of other things that you might want to talk to your community, to your manager about, because these are common things that we hear from management. Um, can't we just take this open source thing and fork it and, and run it ourselves? Well, that's a whole other presentation because, uh, you know, I, I know that some of you are aware of the pains of trying to maintain your own forked version of, a, of an upstream project. Um, Another topic that comes up frequently is can't we just hire or throw money at the, the person, that one individual that's maintaining this project? And perhaps you can. This is a complicated question. There have been several sessions about that at this event, and there is no, no one answer that will, that will fit in all of these situations because money is not necessarily the reason that motivates that particular developer or team. So these are all questions that you need to think about in the context of your company's needs and what projects you rely on, and they will simply not have one simple answer. Uh, the final thing that I want to mention is that this is a long-term investment. This is my son finishing his first half marathon, and it took him all year to train for that. And that is now benefiting him in other ways. He's now an assistant coach on a cross country team. And you know, the analogy only stretches so far, but uh, investing in open source is not going to show immediate gains in your next quarterly profit uh, report. It takes a long time to earn trust in an open source project. It takes a few minutes to lose that trust. Um, it takes a long time to master a complicated project code base. It can take a frustratingly long time to get your, your pull requests merged into a project. And that's another entire conference talk. What do you do when, you're, when you, uh, you've promised your manager that we ha we're going to have influence in this project, and then it takes two years to get your first pull request merged? Uh, that's a, it's a complicated question. <clears throat> so, what I recommend is to uh, look around and have conversations here about the success stories that you can point to as places where people have invested their team and their money and their time in open source projects and how that has paid off in the long term, because this is a long term investment. <clears throat> so, that is... Uh, that's what I had to say. I hope that that was, was helpful. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments, please make sure you grab a mic because I'm deaf and we're streaming. So um, thank you all for, for coming. <laughs>